Get lighting direction. Light comes from all directions and as such creates a variety of different lighting looks. Light direction controls the shape and directions of the shadows and it's the shadows that define the subject, the texture, and the form of who we're photographing. Lighting direction defines the difference between those highlights and shadows and as such comes from all sides and all angles but it's usually defined in the case of portraiture as side light, backlight, front light, top light, and so on. If you take a look at these four pictures, the image on the left is front light, mostly highlight, very little shadow. The second from the left is 45 degree angle. And here you can see more shadow and a little less highlight. The second from the right is side lighting. Here we have about a 50-50 split between shadows and highlights. And then the fourth image on the right is backlit. Here the front of the subject is all in shadow with little bits of highlights showing on the product. All of these lighting angles are useful in portrait photography and you're going to see a little bit more how we can add light using each of these different lighting angles. Here are four photographs that show the same lighting angles used on products and portraits. The left portrait is frontal beauty lighting. Very flat, mostly highlights with a little bit of shadow. The second image is a 45 degree portrait using just a key light and a background light but no fill. Here you can see side light. With the subject facing away from the camera, side lighting becomes a more natural approach to lighting the front of their face. And then finally, a silhouette here is backlit. I don't normally consider this a portrait, but it does give you an idea of the backlighting and the silhouette of a subject. And we'll look at more backlighting techniques coming up. Another important photographic property is what's called angle of incidence. The angle of incidence when using light is an important aspect about lighting and you really should understand it. When a light source emitting light reaches an object at a specific angle, that light is then bounced off the subject at exactly the same angle. When the sun is at a certain point in the sky and it shines light onto a specific surface and let's say it's hitting water on a lake surface and the angle that the sun is at to that surface is 45 degrees, then the light bouncing off the lake or the water surface will also be at a 45 degree angle. Here's a more practical explanation of how that works. Let's say you're inside, you're going to take a picture of a friend standing in front of a large window and you have on your camera a flash unit. When you take the picture, your flash sends light straight at the subject which is also going to hit the glass window and bounces light right back into your lens in the form of a hot spot on the window. This is because the angle of incidence is equal and at the same angle as the light source is from the camera, meaning the light comes out of the camera, goes and hits the glass and bounces right back into the lens. This is a bad angle of incidence in case you're wondering. So the answer to this problem is to move left or right. And as you can see in this diagram, moving the camera to the right and then the light coming out of the flash unit hitting the glass is going to cast off a different direction. And what that really means is that hot spot in the glass is going to be out of view of the camera. So here, let's take a look at a practical example. I have a phone sitting on a white surface and the umbrella that's lighting it is coming down hitting the surface and bouncing into the lens and that's what's creating the hot spot on the phone and the hot spot on the table surface. But if you move the light back or I could have also moved the camera at a different height, the angle of incidence has changed and subsequently if you look at the phone here again the hot spot on the phone is gone and the hot spot that was in the surface is greatly reduced and for the most part gone as well. So now you might be wondering, why is this important? Well, let's take a look. Consider this example. If you need to photograph executives 
in a conference room and there's a giant window behind them and your client has asked you to photograph everybody so that they can see the city skyline out the window behind them and you set up an umbrella it's going to create a reflection in the window so the only way you'll be able to do this is to either change the camera position so that it's not looking straight at the window or you're going to need to move the umbrellas out of the picture a little bit further so that the reflection created in the window is moved out of the frame of what your camera is seeing. In other words, you're changing the angle of incidence so that you don't get a hot spot behind them. And here's an example of exactly the same thing I'm talking about. I had to move my umbrellas way back. Angle of incidence is also the problem we get when we're photographing people with glasses. You have to move your lights around to minimize the reflections. So here we go. One more technical consideration and it's called the inverse square law. And again, when you're talking the fundamentals of lighting, this is important as well. The inverse square law refers to the illumination of a light source and how it varies inversely by the square of the distance from the light source. And you're probably sitting there going, huh? Well, I'll explain it in layman's terms. When you move a light away from the subject, the light is going to fall off. Let's say you have a light source that's three feet from your subject, as seen in these two pictures. On the left, the light source is three feet from the subject. But when I doubled the distance of the light from the product to six feet, the product no longer is receiving half the amount of light, it's only receiving 25% of the light. Doubling the distance cuts the light by about 75% and you have a darker picture. So if you're photographing portraits in the studio and you decide to move a light in closer or move a light back, you're either going to be putting more light on your subject, making them brighter if you get it closer, or if you move it back, the light's going to fall off and you're going to need to increase power to get the equivalent of where you were at before you move the light as far as exposure and brightness. When you're working with strobe lights and ambient light, there are some strategies that you can use in controlling the light. And that's the key to lighting anything, is having total control. So here are the fundamental concepts behind lighting. One of the most important things to understand right off the bat is when you're using a camera with strobe lights, you forget about all the automated features of your camera. I'm speaking of strobes and not TTL based flash systems. Those are automatic metering systems, but generally most strobe lighting kits that you'll be using in the studio are not TTL featured studio strobes. So I'll say it again, forget about all the automated features that you normally use with a flash on your camera. You don't want to use program mode, you don't want to use aperture priority mode, you don't want to use shutter priority mode when you're doing studio portraits with strobe lights and umbrellas and light boxes and so on. You want to use manual shooting mode on your camera, meaning manual adjustment of the aperture, manual adjustment of the shutter speed as well. And more importantly than that, forget completely about your in-camera meter. Think about this, your in-camera meter only measures ambient light. It does not measure the strobe light or it does not help you achieve an automatic reading of your strobe exposure. So from this point on, you'll be using manual shooting mode in your camera, manually setting your aperture, manually setting your shutter speed, and manually adjusting your strobes. And again, I'll explain it very briefly. The strobes that you most likely are using are not going to be made by your camera manufacturer. If you're using Braun Color or Balcar or Alien Bees or anything like that. If you're using flash units designed by your camera manufacturer, that's a different story. But if you're using large strobes in the studio, they're not going to talk to your camera so you don't have any of those automatic features. Now, if this is somewhat challenging to understand, it really is quite simple. So I'm going to go on to the first technical concept around lighting and exposure and shutter speeds and f-stops. So this first fundamental rule is the shutter speed on your camera controls the length of time 
that light is allowed to expose your picture. Again, shutter speed controls the length of time that light is allowed to expose your picture. Now, your f-stop or aperture only controls the amount of light that exposes your picture. You go to a wider aperture, you get more light. You go to a smaller aperture, you get less light when using the exact same shutter speed. So here's another way to look at it. I drew this timeline, which is designed to depict how long a shutter speed is. So let's say that 1 60th of a second is depicted as 3 inches long. Then 1 125th would be 1 and a half inches long because it's half the amount of time that 1 60th is as far as how long the shutter is going to be open. 1 30th would be 6 inches long because it's double the amount of time that 1 60th is. This type of relationship is the same no matter what shutter speeds you're using. So if you look at the chart here, you can see that shutter speed is only going to control ambient light exposure, but not the strobe exposure. F-stop and aperture control the strobe exposure. And again, back to what I just said a couple minutes ago, we're ignoring TTL flash. This is all manual flash or manual strobe units. So again, back to this chart. When your flash unit fires a burst of light, that light's duration is usually somewhere around 1 300th to 1 500th of a second, and that of course is depending on the make and model. So if you use 1 60th of a second on your camera, and you take a picture with the strobe, that flash duration of 1 300th of a second is going to just be a little spike at the very beginning of the time that the shutter opens for that 1 60th of a second. It would also be just a spike at the very beginning of 1 1 25th, 1 30th, 1 15th, and so on. The flash fires as soon as the shutter opens, but the shutter remains open, no matter how long the shutter speed is, to capture the ambient light. But the flash exposure or the strobe, when I'm saying flash or strobe, I mean the same thing, is going to be constant. This proves the shutter speed cannot control the brightness of the flash because it controls only the amount of time that ambient light is recorded. Now one thing I want to throw out here before I move on is different cameras with different shutters are going to have different flash slash strobe sync speeds when you're using strobe or flash. In most cameras, this averages about 1 250th of a second, but in some of the cameras that are still made today, it's only 1 60th of a second. There are a couple cameras that allow 1 320th of a second, but not very many. Again, this is what's called the designated sync speed, and it's the fastest shutter speed you can use with flash or strobe. If you use a shutter speed faster than a designated sync speed, you might actually get an image that's about half black or partially black, and the rest of it a normally exposed picture. And this is because of the sync speed. So again, try to never use more than your designated sync speed in the studio or even when you're using flash. Now to take this concept further, let's take a look at these three photographs. These show how the aperture controls the flash or strobe exposure and the shutter speed controls the ambient. But first we're going to take a look at the ambient. Each of these photos is set at f8 and the strobe power has been set and not changed in these three. The first image on the left is f8 at a half a second. The second one is f8 at an eighth of a second and the third one is f8 at a thirtieth of a second. For the most part, the strobe exposure has not changed, but the ambient light is basically being removed from the photo when you get to 1 30th of a second. That's a two-stop difference between each shutter speed as far as the ambient light goes. Now you will notice the first image versus the last image that the skin tone has gotten a little bit darker, and the reason it has gotten darker is because the ambient light is being removed from her face while the strobe light stays there. So it's basically creating a more contrasty lighting situation. All we're doing here, again, as I want to emphasize, is we're changing the shutter speed to remove ambient light. Now, your aperture or your f-stop controls the amount of light that exposes your picture. 
Let's say, for example, you're in a dark studio. No window light, no ceiling lights on, pitch dark. And you set up a strobe light, and you're going to take a picture, or you're going to photograph a portrait. You set the strobe to full power and F11, and then you take a picture. Because the room is dark, the shutter speed had no effect. You still have a person against a black background. Whether you set your shutter speed to 1 60th or 1 second, there's no ambient light in the room for you to capture. So you still have a dark picture, again, whether you're at 1 60th or 1 second. If the picture was too bright that you just took, you need to change your f-stop to f16, which cuts down the amount of light coming through the lens by half. If the picture is too dark, you would open up your f-stop to f8 to brighten up the subject. But again, because it's a dark room, the shutter speed's not really having any control over the subject. Now let's go to the three pictures again where we're changing the aperture instead of shutter speed, which affected only the ambient. On the left, we have a shutter speed of one quarter of a second with the aperture of f8. And it's a pretty normal looking exposure. The next image is a half a second at f11. So basically what we've done is we've reduced the amount of strobe light coming through the lens. And then the third image is f16 at one second. So each of these three different exposure combinations are really what we can consider to be the same exposure, but just different combinations. So f16 has reduced the amount of strobe light coming through the aperture to light the subject by minus two stops. But we increase the shutter speed two stops to maintain the same ambient exposure. So in each case, the flash exposure got weak while the ambient exposure stayed the same. But there's one more thing here to take a look at. On the final and third image, notice how the color is changing in the background. And this is the result of giving more exposure to the ambient light, which was not daylight balanced like the strobe, and thus it's creating what we call a color shift. So clearly the best photograph is the first image where the strobe exposure is dominant and there's just enough ambient exposure to kind of tell the story of the office here. So now you might be wondering again, why is this important? Well, let's say you have a home studio, the living room of your house, and you got lots of window lights, and you got living room lamps, and you got ceiling light fixtures, and so on. If you use a long shutter speed, all of those lighting situations, all of those ambient light sources are going to be contributing to your picture. And generally, when you're doing studio portrait photography, you don't want that. You want to control all the light from the strobe units that you're setting up. And so it's important to understand that you can block out all those ambient light sources by just simply using the fastest possible shutter speed you can, which is probably going to be about 1 250th of a second. Okay, so here's a couple shots just to give you an idea. This is taken in the studio rather than in a home, but the concept's the same. The ambient light is the modeling lights on the strobe, and you can have the same issues whether it's modeling lights, window light, lamps, ceiling lights, etc. If you look at this first picture, I chose a shutter speed of one second. And notice that, first of all, she's blurry, but also notice that there's light showing up everywhere. And this is from the modeling lights. One second shutter speed allowed the modeling lights to contribute to the overall lighting scheme for her. But of course, that's not what I wanted. So I changed my shutter speed to 1 125th and it is not enough time to allow the ambient light to contribute to the exposure. And subsequently, all the ambient light is blocked out. And that, of course, is the goal. This video is to discuss the role of aperture with using on-camera flash as well as studio strobes. So what's the difference between those two? flash and strobes. Your on-camera flash, like a Nikon SB900 or a Canon 580EX, have built-in technology that allows it to talk to the camera. So when you change your aperture on your camera, the flash knows it if you are in TTL mode. So for example, let's say you are at F8 and you have TTL with your on-camera flash engaged. 
you change your aperture from f8 to f11, and the flash will automatically compensate for that change and increase flash output for that new f-stop at f11. Manual flash or studio strobes, which are not TTL, will not make that adjustment automatically. So you would, in those cases, increase your flash or studio strobe output to compensate for any change in aperture. So here is a picture shot at f11 with my flash in manual mode. So it's a perfect flash exposure. Now, if I change my aperture to f8, Notice how it's overexposed or overflashed. And that's because it's in manual flash. It's going to output the same amount of light every single time. And so to compensate, I would want to reduce the output of my flash. But of course, that's not what I'm talking about at this point. If I was to go the other way from F11 to F16, here I have a picture that's under flashed. The flash unit on camera here is outputting the same amount of light every single flash. Here it was perfect at f11 and then over flashed at f8 and under flashed at f16. So this is important if you're using studio strobes which are non-TTL out here doing the same thing you'd have the same results. This short video is to show you how you separate your subject from the background or how you control the ambient background light with your shutter speed only. And that's an important concept to grasp. The shutter speed can only lighten or darken your background, but not the flash exposure. It's because there's two different light sources. You have your ambient light and you have your flashlight. Where normally when you're shooting outdoors, you really only have one light source. It's the outdoor light or the sun. But when you add the flash to the equation, you now have two light sources and you control them separately. This one is to talk about how you control the brightness or darkness of the background with your shutter speed. So we have this flower here and it's in the shade. Even though you can see a little bit of sunlight over here, it for the most part is in the shade. And this is what the camera meter is showing as a normal exposure for the background. And that's probably because this is in the shade and there's some shadows and stuff like that. So the meter here was fooled a little bit. But, you know, I also want this flower to stand out a little bit more from the background. So this is 1 60th. The next image here, I went to 1 1 25th. So as you see, we now have even more separation. The grass is a little bit darker. The shadows are darker. And all I did was change my shutter speed. Flash exposure remains the same, but I went to a faster shutter speed. When you're in an automated shooting mode like Aperture Priority, you're going to use the EC button on Nikons, or you're just going to spin your quick dial, uh, or one of your dials on the Canon that shows a minus background exposure. And that's basically how you darken the background. Here I went to 1 250th of a second. And as you can see, it's really dark, and that flower really, really pops out. Now, if you think about how you might use this, it could be everything under the sun, from nature photography to you're taking a picture of somebody, like they show in the magazines quite often. You've got a guy standing on a rock, and the background's very dark, and the sun's up in the sky kind of bursting. And this is a popular technique for making the subject stand out from the background. I'm sure you agree, if you look at this one, the flower doesn't stand out from the background very much. But by doing a minus exposure compensation on the background to 1 250th, the flower really pops. It's a creative technique that's very useful. So here's another one. Uh, here I am, uh, this is actually shot in P mode, which is why 1 60th is the longest shutter speed um, used in P mode. And the sky is very dark. But if you 
get out of P mode and go to a manual mode or an aperture priority mode by increasing the background exposure plus one stop in compensation. So that's from 1 60th to 1 30th of a second. The background's lighter. But I want it even brighter. And here I am closer to about 1 15th to 1 10th of a second. And now the background looks a lot more normal. Plus there's detail in here. So again, the whole goal or point of this video is to show you that you can lighten or darken your background with your shutter speed and you control flash separately. The same theory applies in the studio. If you look at these two images on the left I accidentally left my shooting mode in aperture priority and it chose at f8 a shutter speed of eight seconds and that means this image is lit pretty much with the modeling light in my light box at rather than the actual strobe exposure so what happened is I clicked the shutter the shutter opened the strobe fired which is why there's a sharp edge on her and then the shutter stayed open for eight seconds and on the right is the 1 1 25th that is the proper shutter speed that I really wanted to use and as a result, it doesn't have any exposure of the ambient light or the modeling light coming from the strobe like the image on the left does. So this is, indicates that shutter speed really didn't control the flash exposure. In this case, the ambient exposure was the modeling light on the strobe. One thing I think it's important for you to understand is the shooting mode you choose for your camera. When you're in the studio, nothing is automatic. Outdoors you may be using aperture priority or shutter priority or program mode and enjoy using those because of the ease it is to get good pictures. But in the studio, everything's manual. You don't want to use aperture priority, shutter priority or program mode. You must disengage your camera from those automatic modes and go to manual. The reason is you are using a select light source in the studio and that's your strobes whether it be umbrellas, light boxes, or whatever, you are using those as your only light source. So when you use aperture priority, shutter priority, or program mode, you're telling the camera to look at all the light sources and include those in your exposures, and there you end up with incorrect exposures and bad pictures. So the number one thing to remember when using your strobes is to disengage aperture priority or shutter priority and go to manual shooting mode on your camera. Here's some examples showing you why. In this first example, you can see the result of using aperture priority mode. Notice the blurring, the amber color cast, and of course the overexposure. Well, this is what happens when you use aperture priority mode in a dark studio. It is searching for the proper exposure for all the light that's in the studio, not just your strobes. There's where the problem lies. In this case, the shutter speed was actually eight seconds long. The camera chose that because it was dark in there and it wanted to provide a proper exposure not only for the strobes but also for the ceiling lights and the modeling lights and so on. So obviously this doesn't work. Aperture priority doesn't allow you to shoot the way you want to shoot with studio strobes. In this second exposure, you can see the results of using manual shooting mode only, with the camera set at 1 125th of a second. That shutter speed is too fast to allow any time for ambient light or window light or even the modeling lights to contribute to your exposure. So this picture is only the strobe lighting showing up, and that is specifically the result of a fast shutter speed. If you're on location, you may want some window light to come through and light a background. Then you're going to choose a shutter speed that's longer and allows that light to come in. But when you're in the studio doing portraits and products, rarely, if ever, is any ambient light going to be so nice or so appealing that it's going to actually help your subject. The whole goal is to light your subject as nice as you can with strobes only. So use a fast shutter speed and manual shooting mode and you'll quickly get there. But if you close your eyes